you start here? Yeah, let's go ahead and start. All right, so I will, um, okay, so I will introduce Kevin. All right, so for everybody, uh, this is uh, my utmost pleasure to introduce Kevin today. Uh, because uh, since I know Kevin, uh, when he, since he was uh, an undergraduate student here at UNH, it feels as if it was only yesterday that Kevin joined our group in his freshman year back in uh, 2009, and he stayed with us until he graduated. Although a young undergraduate at the time, he immersed himself into our research interests and needs and very quickly became a vital member of our group. At first, he worked on the cluster CODIF instrument cross calibrations and the CODIF data improvement during magnetosith encounters. I hope you remember all this, Kevin. In the later years, he worked on his final year thesis research, which was on the role of oxygen of ionospheric origin in magnetopause reconnection using cluster data. He was, and he still is, uh, what I call a willing writer. He would effortlessly express his thoughts in writing. His final year thesis was 100 pages long and produced illustrations that I still use today, while he created documents of his work here that I still use when a new student joins our group. But his biggest traits were his work ethic and enthusiasm. Morse Hall was his second home. His enthusiasm for his research was contagious to his peers who were frequently joining him until late at the lab. After UNH, he joined the Southwest Research Institute to do his graduate research, and he took his PhD from the University of Texas at San Antonio. His doctoral research was on the special characteristics of magnetic reconnection with Stephen Fuselier and Jerry Goldstein as his advisors. His presence at Southwest and his interest in reconnection were nicely aligned with uh, the upcoming, and upcoming, at the time, MMS mission. Therefore, the transition into the MMS project was almost inevitable. However, he did not seek the easy road. Pursuing to expand his scientific and cultural experiences, after he was done with his PhD at Southwest, he joined the Space Research Institute at Graz in Austria as a postdoc. He very quickly became fully immersed in the MMS research and became the, one of the most active young scientists in the project. After his postdoc at Graz, Coming full circle, he joined Roy Torbett's group here at UNH as a research scientist at first, and as a Southwest research scientist now, where he continues his work on MMS and magnetic reconnection. Today, Kevin will talk about uh, a recent breakthrough results on his work on the onset of magnetic reconnection in Earth's magnetotail. Take over, Kevin. So thanks, Chris, and that's exactly why I was hoping you would introduce me is because you're nice enough to describe my 100 page undergraduate thesis as being a gifted writer rather than being extraordinarily long-winded so <laughs> so without further ado um i just want to point out um uh give credit to all my co-authors here but i want to point out uh particularly uh, the contribution of charlie ferugia So I'll start with my outline here. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course, Charles. Um, so start with an introduction, basically, who, what, when, where, why, um, and so what, who cares of um, the magnetotail reconnection and magnetotail reconnection. And go through a brief history of um, how people think tail reconnection is initiated and um, sort of wrap all that up with uh, a couple big remaining questions about um, how tail reconnection is initiated um, and then explain why those remaining questions remain. Um, the bulk of this talk is gonna be about one event. Um, so I'll touch on the data set um, before digging into this really just beautiful event. Um, and then I'll wrap it all up in the end. So the magneto tail. It's the portion of the night side magnetosphere that's dragged anti-sunward by the solar wind plasma flow. And these elongated field lines are supported by uh, an equatorial current sheet. That current sheet runs from dawn to dusk. Um, and it's been known since uh, very early 
uh, in the exploration of the magnetosphere, that the tail goes through a cycle of um, storing and then releasing energy. And so sort of the action, a lot of the action is at this current sheet, the current sheet that, that may initially be very thick um, on the scale of several Earth radii, um, becomes thin uh, as energy is stored in the tail. The current sheet then short, short circuits. Um, hopefully everybody can see the air quotes. Um, and then the current sheet expands again. And so the intermediate step, the short circuiting of the current sheet, um, uh, quote unquote, is reconnection. So in three steps here, this is a cartoon of reconnection happening. Um, now you start with here two plasmas on the top and bottom, the red and blue, um, with anti-parallel uh, embedded magnetic fields. Um, two things you know about that immediately. Um, uh, these plasmas are going to be separated by a current sheet, this gray line down the middle, and oppositely polarized magnetic fields tracked. So under certain circumstances, um, one being that the plasmas have to be close enough together, the current sheet separating them has to be thin enough. Um, those magnetic fields can attract each other, they slip through the plasma, and they become interconnected. Um, and then those interconnected field lines then get ejected uh, to the left and right. Um, in that process, uh, the reconnection continues with um, field lines inflowing, reconnecting, and then outflowing. Um, so uh, a few reasons we care about reconnection. Um, these field lines, as they reconnect, um, the energy that's stored in the magnetic field, some of it gets uh, converted to particle kinetic energy. Um, reconnection also moves uh, pressure around, it circulates energy. Uh, and then finally, it changes the magnetic topology, so it can interconnect plasmas that weren't previously connected. And ultimately, reconnection is um, a kinetic scale process, a very, a very small scale process. Um, so now I've moved to a more realistic uh, cartoon of what the magnetotail current sheet looks like. So previously we had um, anti-parallel separated plasmas here. Um, there are sort of stretched field lines that cross the current sheet. Um, and in order to get reconnection uh, on this current sheet, um, you need to have uh, this or any current sheet, um, you need to allow uh, particles to slip across magnetic field lines. Um, and so inherently that requires that you break uh, ideal MHD. Um, that occurs in a very small uh, kinetic scale diffusion region. Really, it's nested diffusion regions. Um, uh, and sort of the, the, critical, uh, the critical aspect of this is that that diffusion region is, um, is on the scale of um, your gyro radius or your, your kinetic scale. Um, so if the current sheet there is thin enough, if the magnetic gradient is thin enough, um, then particles can't complete an orbit. Um, and they either scatter or meander across field lines. Um, and then of course, an initial condition is, is um, for reconnection to occur, is that this, um, this magnetic field uh, that's, that's uh, non-zero at the current sheet center has to be pretty small. So that, that increases your scale size um, of the particle motion and then thinning the current sheet. Um, uh, both of those, um, uh, work together to give you a kinetic scale current sheet. Um, uh, but, but those two conditions are alone uh, are insufficient for giving you reconnection. Uh, and really it's been known uh, since the early days of cluster that you can have uh, ion scale current sheets that are perfectly stable. Um, and so the set of criteria that give you reconnection is really the purpose of this study. So now back up a little bit. Um, the so what, who cares, and sort of the big picture of what reconnection does in the magnetosphere, uh, even though reconnection itself is sort of a teeny tiny process. Um, and so the picture of reconnection in the magnetosphere starts at the sun, uh, more accurately in the solar wind. The solar wind connects, uh, convex the interplanetary magnetic field to Earth. When the interplanetary magnetic field is southward, um, it's oppositely aligned with the uh, low latitude uh, magnetic field at the day side magnetopause, um, thus potentially giving you uh, reconnection there. Um, and so reconnection at the low latitude magnetopause opens up uh, the magnetosphere to the solar wind. Uh, it's, you can see in this cartoon, it's sort of opening up field lines. Uh, and then those opened uh, field lines are convected 
uh, away from the uh, reconnection site um, in bidirectional jets. So they move over the, over the poles toward the tail. Uh, and as they do move over the polar caps, um, they draw, uh, that sort of convection motion sets up um, large scale circulation in the ionosphere, this two cell convection. Um, and it also uh, gives you a, a cross polar cap uh, electric field. Um, now moving into the tail, uh, so these field lines have convected over the poles, and uh, now they sink into the tail. Um, this is sort of a steady state cartoon here, but if, if tail reconnection wasn't occurring, you can imagine how uh, field lines sinking into the tail continuously without this release would eventually build up and build up. Um, so uh, day side reconnection then plays a critical role in energy storage. Um, the increased pressure at high latitudes pushes inward on the equatorial current sheet, giving you that current sheet thinning. Um, and then eventually that pressure is released by tail reconnection, which is, which is actually what I'm showing here. Um, and then tail reconnection gives you this sort of um, watershed, uh, watershed like feature where, where um, on one side of it, all your energy is moving earthward. On the other side of it, all your energy is getting ejected from the tail. Um, the energy that moves earthward uh, hits the inner magnetosphere, it can deliver um, uh, uh, plasma to um, pump up the ring current. It can provide seed electrons to pump up the Van Allen radiation belts, um, and it can cause aurora. Um, and so to predict space storms, uh, geomagnetic storms, substorms, it'd be really handy to know when, where, why uh, reconnection occurs. There we go. Um, uh, so a brief history. Um, so I introduced, uh, you know, it, it's been known for a long time that the current sheet thins before, um, before reconnection is initiated. Um, the, the cause of the current sheet thinning could be twofold. I don't think anyone would disagree that there needs to be an external trigger um, for, for current sheet thinning. Um, and so I've talked about this, uh, this sort of external driver being the, the solar wind with southward IMF. Um, and I talked about how uh, day side reconnection can load the tail um, and give you, give you current sheet thinning that way. Uh, another way you can get um, uh, current, uh, current sheet thinning via day side reconnection is with this redistribution of flux. So when the day side is getting depleted um, by reconnection, um, that can sap field lines um, from the tail out along the third dimension over to the day side. So, so um, you can either increase the pressure um, outside of the tail current sheet, or you can reduce the pressure uh, inside the tail current sheet. And both these require southward IMF and day side reconnection. Um, there can also be an internal driver of thinning. Um, uh, current sheet instabilities, I won't go through these, but ballooning, uh, interchange, um, magnetic flux release, flapping, other ones. Um, uh, sort of internal instabilities can aid the thinning of the current sheet. So that's how the current sheet gets thin. Now, the other question is, in your thin current sheet, what is it that actually triggers reconnection? So this is more of a microscopic question. Um, and, and there are a number of possibilities. So, um, so uh, uh, you may need perturbations from these thin current sheet instabilities as possible. That reconnection is preceded by some other instability. Um, reconnection can also happen by um, uh, sort of develop as an MHD, uh, a larger scale instability, this ion tearing instability, or, uh, it, or reconnection can be triggered just as a kinetic scale instability, this electron tearing instability. And tearing here just refers to the, the sort of current sheet is being torn apart, the field lines are being torn. Um, uh, and, and so ultimately, you know, we, we care about this microscopic question. Um, because uh, it has implications for what does the current sheet need to look, you know, what does the magnetotail current sheet need to look like before it basically tears itself apart. Um, and I've written down here, uh, uh, you know what, I'm just going to skip that. Um, uh, and, and so just to, just to sort of wrap up, summarize here, these are, the, these are the two big questions that aren't totally separated from one another. Um, they're really interconnected. Uh, the two big questions, one focuses on the large scale, which is um, how does the magneto, uh, you know, in asking um, how does tail reconnection occur, uh, 
you have to know how does the cross-tail current sheet become thin? Um, what aspects of the solar wind magnetosphere interaction uh, enable reconnection? Uh, and then you also have to ask the microscopic side of the question, which is in that thin current sheet, how does reconnection occur? How is reconnection triggered? Uh, and so the reason these questions remain really um, is, 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 a, is a real and true answer. Um, will require an immense amount of data. Um, you need to have a vast sort of network of observatories um, looking at all different aspects of the solar wind, the magnetosphere, how they couple. Um, and then uh, so that's the large scale. The, the, the small scale, you also need to be really in the right place at the right time to actually capture the kinetic reconnection onset, sort of the needle in the haystack there. Um, so I'll wrap up the introduction there, move on briefly to, um, to sort of start introducing this, this, this really nice event we're looking at. Um, that's, that's pretty much exactly the, the data set that we're working with, that one I just described. Um, so uh, this is a, a picture of the magnetosphere on the left here. I've, I've uh, drawn out where each one of our um, spacecraft or uh, missions are. Here, so, um, so the sort of telescope, the big picture, um, we have the, the wind, uh, wind satellite um, in the upstream solar wind. Um, so that'll, that'll look at uh, the, the plasma that's impacting the Earth. We have two of the Themis spacecraft at the magnetopause. Um, we'll use those to look for jets uh, for, for day side reconnection to see how the solar wind is coupling um, to the magnetosphere, to the day side magnetosphere. Um, we also have the SuperDARN uh, radar array um, and, and the Ampere uh, magnetometer uh, satellite networks. Um, that'll tell us about uh, the uh, polar cap, um, whether field lines are convecting from the day side magnetosphere into the tail. Uh, we also have MMS in the tail current sheet that will look at how the current sheet evolves and how reconnection onset works. Uh, and then finally, we have um, DMSP uh, at the foot point of MMS. Um, which will tell us about um, sort of the feedback between MMS and the, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the magnetotail and the night side ionosphere. Um, and I'm duplicating these missions here. MMS is also our teles, uh, uh, sorry, our, our microscope. Um, sort of on this scale, MMS is essentially one spacecraft on this, on this first, on the scale of this first plot. Um, but once we really zoom into reconnection onset, um, it finally becomes handy that MMS is actually four spacecraft. Um, so, uh, so I want to break down talking about this event, uh, in the following way. So, so sort of three acts, we'll see how one tail reconnection event sort of unfolds. And we're going to start in the tail, um, you know, at, in the initial conditions, when the tail is utterly quiet, the tail conditions are such that it should, it should not reconnect. And then we're going to look at, um, you know, each sort of step of the way of how that quiet, very stable tail eventually undergoes this explosive reconnection onset. Um, so start here, the initial conditions. Um, so this is, this is basically how I'm going to try to organize the, um, the remaining slides here. So somewhere on the slide, there will be a picture like this. Um, this, is a, this is our global MHD model with where each of our spacecraft are. So this will be a helpful reminder of when I show you data from some spacecraft, you can see, you can see where it, that spacecraft actually is. Um, I'm also going to show this one plot. Um, you can't read it. Uh, there's, uh, unless you have a huge screen. Um, uh, there's too much information on here likely to show at once, but uh, I'm going to keep it on here anyways, so I can show you um, when uh, something I'm referring to is happening. Um, and then ultimately what I'm going to show you is this, a sort of zoom in of some aspect on the, of this plot. And, and, and so I'll point to basically whether this happened at the beginning of the, the event, in the initial conditions phase, um, and in this later phase when the tail current sheet was thinning, or finally during the reconnection onset. So this it just sort of help us keep track of really an otherwise overwhelming amount of data. Um, so initial conditions, all is quiet in the tail. Um, 
zoom in on the MMS data, um, the, um, the X component of the magnetic field, X is the sun earth line, um, is, is quiet. It's, it's close to zero, but not quite zero. MMS is sitting in the plasma sheet. Everything's pretty quiet. Um, the Z component of the magnetic field, which is the north-south component, this is the sort of the value, uh, the proxy for the value of the um, uh, magnetic field um, at the uh, at the current sheet. Um, it's large, so there's a large um, magnetic field in the current sheet, and then the current sheet itself is thick, about one to two re, uh, the half thickness there. So, um, so. Uh, Thick current sheet, strong magnetic field, there's no way you're getting reconnection here. The inciting incident. Um, so something acts on this tail, something has to act on this tail to, um, to make it evolve toward reconnection. Um, and, and what we find here is, um, is that the, uh, the, the action on the tail is provided sort of by a, a one-two punch from the solar wind. Um, and I'll dig into this in the next slide. Um, really, this sort of action is coming from the solar wind dynamic pressure. Um, so the magnetosphere is a sort of bubble in balance with the solar wind pressure. Um, and so if the solar wind pressure ramps up, it will compress that bubble. Um, and so, so what I'm showing here is the solar wind pressure on the top during the entire event. And you can see that, um, that the sort of overall profile here is that the solar wind pressure ramps up, it slowly decreases, and then there's a little ramp up again. Um, and then you can see the effects, I'll get into this in a bit more detail in the next slides, but you can see the effect of that compression on the Earth um, in the horizontal component of the magnetic field measured at the ground, um, and then also in Themis, that was at the day side magnetopause. So the magnetopause moved in across Themis. So, the takeaway is that um, is that the solar wind compression is acting on the otherwise quiet tail, um, quiet magnetosphere, and then we'll dig into how the tail responds in a bit. Um, but so first, you know, in my in my sort of big picture, so what, who cares slide, I sort of outlined each step of the way of how the solar wind um, reconnects with the dayside magnetosphere, then field lines move over the poles into the tail. So, anyways, in these next few slides, we're going to sort of step through all the data to look at each step of that way, figure out, um, figure out how, things, how things are working. Um, so the next step, the solar wind hits the magnetopause and, and possibly the magnetopause reconnects if the solar wind magnetic field is pointing southward. And what we find is that the solar wind magnetic field is not pointing southward. Um, it's pointing either downward or duskward, I don't, I don't quite remember. Um, but, uh, but really what that, um, what that tells you is you can sort of calculate this proxy, how much energy is being supplied to the magnetosphere from the solar wind. Um, the solar wind energy input is very small. Um, the, uh, so, uh, so again, here I'm showing the solar wind dynamic pressure. There's that sort of one-two punch profile. Um, below that, I'm showing the solar wind energy input. Um, that's the red line. Uh, the blue dashed line is the, is the value for a typical substorm. Um, you can see what we're working with for this event is, is smaller. Um, I think roundabout by an order of magnitude. Um, so it's, so we would expect the solar wind to not be, um, you know, just pouring tons of energy into the magnetosphere. Um, we can also confirm that by looking at the Themis data that we're at the low latitude magnetopause. Um, uh, and so the way to really efficiently couple solar wind in the magnetosphere is to just open up the magnetosphere to the solar wind by day side reconnection. Uh, so the, the sort of smoking gun signature of that happening would be jets, fast plasma jets. Um, now we can look at the, um, at the Themis data here uh, to look for magnetopause crossings and see if there are jets at the magnetopause. Magnetopause crossings, you move from the, sh from the magneto sheet, the shock solar wind, to the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere has hot sparse plasma, the magnetosheath has a uh, warm, dense plasma. So you look for a, a, identifying a magnetopause crossing, you look for a transition in those uh, plasma properties. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure if this is going to come out on everyone's screen, but I've marked magnetopause crossings with vertical thin black lines here. 
Um, I've also said no ion jets, which give away my punchline, which is that at each one of these crossings, um, there are no ion jets. There's no evidence that the, um, that the plasma is, is being accelerated by reconnection. Um, and so at these two spacecraft, which are at the magnetopause at slightly different local times, um, there's no evidence for, um, for day side reconnection, uh, significant day side reconnection. And that sort of fits with the expected picture that we get from this really low level solar wind energy input. Um, but in our back pocket, we still have this compression. So just to make sure we didn't miss anything, the polar cap sort of give the, the polar cap, Ampere and Superdarn are monitoring the polar cap. These missions should be capable of providing us a sort of more global picture of what's happening compared to Themis, which is really just, Themis can answer the question, is, magneto, is magnetopause reconnection happening at this point or this point? You know, it may miss reconnection happening elsewhere. So for that reason, we look at the polar cap um, via uh, Ampere and Superdome. So Ampere tells us about the currents. It's this network of magnetometers. Um, you take a curl of all these different magnetometer measurements and you can get a map of the current. Uh, and if field lines are convecting over the poles, you get this really well-defined current system. Um, and then uh, Superdarn, uh, I uh, was going to look this up. Now I have forgotten it. Somehow they can find, uh, and if there's a question on this, I will direct it to Charlie because he was the one who, who did this for this study. Somehow they find um, the cross polar cap potential. Uh, I think from their sort of convection maps, I don't know. Uh, don't ask me questions on that. Um, anyways, yeah. yeah, from the convection maps. Thanks, Charlie. Um, uh, uh, so they can get the cross polar cap potential. So we have the current system, we have the cross polar cap potential. Both of those show all's quiet in the polar cap. Um, uh, so uh, you can see uh, on this top, this is uh, the ampere. Um, ampere currents as a function of um, uh, latitude and time. I, I guess I didn't say that earlier. These uh, all future plots have time on the um, uh, on the horizontal axis. Um, uh, this horizontal uh, dashed line gives you um, the expected convection boundary, um, and uh, and you can really see. Uh, so really active events, you'll have pronounced upward and downward or downward and upward currents right on either side of this convection boundary. You can, you can get a sort of taste of, of what that looks like off to the right of this plot, but sort, sort of during the main action, um, uh, uh, there's, there's nothing to report. Um, and, and the same is true for the cross polar cap potential. Um, the black line gives you the cross polar cap potential measured by Superdarn. Um, the horizontal dashed blue line gives you the threshold. I pulled from a couple different papers and then took an a few different papers and took an average of what people use to define quiet times. And you can see what we're working with for this event is below quiet times. So at this point in the talk, all signs point to the fact that the solar wind is not supplying energy to the tail via day side reconnection. Energy is not, you know, field lines are not opening. They're not convecting over the, pole, over the poles into the tail. We still have the compression. Speaking of the compression, good time to remind you here. Um, there's the, the quiet tail, um, which is out on the left side of the plot. Um, there's this first solar wind pressure pulse that then dies down in the second one. Uh, and so right after uh, the first solar wind pressure pulse, that is the start of, so I was saying this three act play here, that's the start of my act two. So we're now looking at the tail, transitioning from the quiet tail to the active tail. Um, and ultimately, you know, what we've shown so far is, uh, you know, in terms of external triggers with the tail, um, is most likely responding to uh, is this ramp up in the solar wind pressure that that compresses the magnetosphere. Um, so again, I'm showing um, the X component of the magnetic field um, in blue. Below that, the vertical component of the magnetic field in red. 
that um, uh, current sheet half thickness uh, below that in uh, black, and then the the current strength in red. And so we're looking um, we're looking at the current sheet um, out here in the tail, just as a reminder. So. Um, so everything remains pretty quiet. Um, MMS is still in the central plasma sheet. It's still in these closed field lines where the um, equatorial current is. Um, but what we see is over the course of this is a, about a two hour plot. We see that over the course of about two hours, the tail is slowly evolving. Um, now the magnetic field, the north-south magnetic field um, is, is slowly reduced. Um, is the field lines are sort of being stretched out. So the field lines are being pulled out, stretched, elongated more. Um, and and the um, intensity of the magnetic field in the current sheet is being reduced. Uh, the current sheet is also thinning. It thins by about a factor of two to four. Um, and the current is also getting more concentrated. Um, and so you can see here the timing of this lines up pretty nicely with the impact of this um, solar wind dynamic pressure pulse. Um, so you can see this, uh, the, the tail's response is to sort of, um, is to sort of the BZ, uh, the north-south magnetic field is suddenly reduced and then it continues slowly reducing and then the current sheet uh, thickness is also reducing. So, um, so the features that stabilize the tail against reconnection, the, all the features of the tail that prevent reconnection from happening are slowly being peeled away. Um, and an interesting question that we were stuck on for some time is, is why? So, um, so initially, the, there's this compression from the solar wind. Um, uh, all of a sudden, the force from the solar wind inward on the magnetosphere, uh, inward on the magnetotail ramps up. But then you can see after this ramp up in the solar wind pressure, um, the pressure slowly decreases. So that drivers sort of slowly vanishes. Um, but yet the tail current sheet continues to thin and the field lines continue to stretch and the current continues to concentrate. So the question is why? What's causing that? There's we've now ruled out, you know, two huge potential external drivers being the solar wind via day side reconnection, the solar wind via compression. So just to make sure I didn't miss anything, let's look at the tail pressure. Um, so I'm zooming in on this slow, fin slow thinning phase. That's my act two. Um, top again here, I have the solar wind dynamic pressure, the current, um, uh, the current density uh, in the tail, and then the tail pressure. Uh, and then below that, I have this um, energy time pressure spectrogram. So this tells you how much pressure is being carried by these protons uh, at different energies at different times. Um, and, in, and in the tail, the, um, the pressure at the center of the current sheet is mostly from the, from, from the protons. So we expect this to be sort of the dominant pressure um, at, right at the center of the tail current sheet. So um, uh, anyways, uh, start here. The solar wind pressure ramps up, decreases, ramps up. Um, now, just to make sure nothing else sort of fishy is going on, I looked at the um, the tail pressure. So this black line is the total MHD pressure in the tail. And you can see that essentially it just tracks the solar wind dynamic pressure, ramp up and then decrease. And then act three happens later. Um, and so it's it's interesting. It's sort of confirming that there's no, no external forces that might be um, compressing the tail current sheet to give you this, this really slow, long two hour thinning of the current sheet. Um, and if the, I think the next, yeah, here we go. Uh, and then I'll, I'll transition to this metaphor here. So we want to shrink the current sheet. I'll use the, I'll use a balloon as a probably, uh, well, certainly oversimplified metaphor here. Three ways you can shrink a, shrink a balloon. One, you can squish it. You can add external pressure. We have now sort of ruled that out. The current sheet isn't being compressed from the outside. Um, you can also let some air out of the balloon to shrink it. Um, or you can stick it in the fridge. You can cool it down. 
Um, so, uh, so that analogy, we can, uh, if we're not compressing the current sheet, um, we could either uh, be evacuating um, particles from within it um, or, or, or pressure from within it, um, or uh, we could be cooling it or both. Um, uh, and, and that's essentially uh, what we see here is when you look at this pressure energy time spectrogram, um, it's right at this initial compression. Um, uh, the pressures being uh, at, at the center of the current sheet is carried by sort of one to 10-ish keV protons. Um, uh, and then uh, as, the, um, sort of as the pressure is decreasing in the tail, yet the current sheet continues to thin, um, higher energy protons start disappearing. Um, so uh, so uh, it's interesting, you might ask, where, where do we see those particles going? Um, uh, I won't show all the plots I made, but I'll just tell you, um, those particles are moving parallel uh, to the magnetic field. They're moving toward Earth out of the current sheet. Um, and there's effectively very little at this stage perpendicular. Um, there's, there's very little convection. Uh, so the question is, um, these field lines uh, are connected to the ionosphere. It's in principle possible that these high energy particles that had previously carried the current um, in the, in the current, uh, sorry, the pressure in the current sheet have been scattered, um, are traveling along field lines and then lost the ionosphere. So there's this potential mechanism for um, letting some air out of the balloon potentially or evacuating um, particles from the uh, from the current sheet. Um, now, to see whether or not that explanation uh, makes any sense whatsoever, um, we looked at DMSP. Um, so MS is out here at the tail. DMSP during this time does two passes um, through the low latitude ionosphere. Uh, sorry, the um, high latitude ionosphere at the foot point of the MMS field lines. Uh, and we can look at the, the particle precipitation uh, on the left before and on the right during this slow thinning phase. And so uh, electron precipitation uh, is here on the top. Uh, ion precipitation is here on the bottom. This is energy uh, and time. Um, and, uh, and really only a very small sliver is totally relevant to this story. The MSP is low altitude, so it moves very quickly. Um, and, and the field line is so it passes really through really quickly through the region that maps out to MMS. Um, though, of course, uh, you know, a broader region maps out to a broader region of the tail. Um, and so on the left here, I'm showing um, the precipitation. Uh, this, these two little boxes show you the, um, the foot point of MMS, by the way. Um, the, but the left plot shows you a cut um, through uh, in latitude um, before this slow thinning phase. So there's some um, precipitation, low, uh, low energy ions, low energy electrons. Um, but then during this slow thinning phase, when MMS tells us, okay, these, uh, this slow thinning might be caused by losses to the ionosphere, um, what DMSP shows is that actually the losses to the ionosphere are ramping up. Um, and, and also uh, it's uh, a higher energy ions um, in the sort of one to 10 keV range that are precipitating. So the punchline for this slide is, you know, we wanted to know in the absence of anything else that might be causing the current sheet to thin, it, is it plausible that the current sheet could be thinning because um, we're evacuating pressure from inside of it rather than adding pressure to the outside of it. Um, and the answer that I get from this is yes, that's plausible. Um, now the quick recap here. So we started with a tail that had a, had a large magnetic field and a thick current sheet that tail should not reconnect. We've now slowly, over a couple hours, um, first via compression, 
and then second via this um, sort of pressure uh, diminution. Um, we've thinned the current sheet, we've reduced the magnetic field, and effectively just turned the tail into a powder keg. This tail is ready to go. Um, still not reconnecting, but um, we've taken away all the things that, uh, sort of kicked the legs out from underneath it, taken away all the things to stabilize it. Uh, enter stage left, the second of our two solar wind pressure pulses, the second of our one-two punch here. Now, oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure why this, uh, on my screen at least, this, this plot looks a little bit low resolution, but I'll explain things as we go here. Um, so top is the solar wind dynamic pressure, everything else below that is all MMS, so this is all the magneto tail. Um, and I'm going to go through, you know, sort of this uh, vertical dashed line here, marks the time of the arrival of the second solar wind pressure pulse. And I'm going to go sort of go through one by one uh, what happens uh, to the tail current sheet when this pressure pulse hits the sort of powder keg tail. First, current sheet thickness. Whereas it had slowly thinned over the course of a couple hours, all of a sudden the current sheet just collapses. And it collapses well below an ion, uh, the ion kinetic scale. The cross tail current is concentrated. You know, just like I was saying before, whereas it, that was sort of happening slowly, now all of a sudden the, the current density spikes up. Um, agyrotropy, so uh, so the um, uh, the sort of proxy for um, disorder of the uh, this is for ions the um, the disorder of the ion uh, distribution around the magnetic field. So this will tell you if you have sort of meandering or scattering um, motions rather than just simple uh, simple orbits. Um, so the agyrotropy uh, that was sort of slowly um, slowly increasing here all of a sudden spikes. So that tells you all of a sudden you have these, this this um, uh, you know kinetic motion of your particles dominating. Um, flapping. Uh, now, whereas the um, the plasma sheet was nice and quiet during this sort of preconditioning, this slow thinning phase, um, all of a sudden these high frequency waves kick in. And we'll dig into the timing of those waves in a second here. But um, And then lastly, most importantly for this talk, reconnection. Reconnection in the tail current sheet. So this is the, this, the telltale signature for reconnection here. Um, uh, this uh, this box here that I'm highlighting uh, with my cursor. Um, this is the uh, x component of the velocity, um, which uh, which uh, following the collapse of the current sheet um, goes sharply uh, negative. Um, uh, the plasmas the plasma ions are going uh, tailward, um, and then it it almost immediately reverses, and the um, plasma ions are going uh, earthward. Um, Lastly, the uh, the total pressure, uh, sorry, uh, second to last here, total pressure um, of the tail all of a sudden drops, so sort of the tail pressure plummets um, at the MMS location. That tells you that reconnection is now sort of actively pushing pressure, um, moving energy away from the MMS location. Um, and then the uh, north-south magnetic field um, shows really high frequency oscillations. So uh, almost, you know, at this scale, and especially with the poor resolution of this plot, uh, something that essentially just looks like noise. And so the takeaway here is that this solar wind pressure pulse, the second solar wind pressure pulse, hit the tail, disturbed this sort of delicate equilibrium, and just it's collapsed and started reconnecting. So now I'm going to transition to, to MMS microscope. And now finally, I consider the fact that MMS is more than one spacecraft. Um, so uh, at the top panel here, I'm, well, again, I'm just showing one MMS spacecraft in this plot. I'm showing BX uh, and then uh, EZ. Um, so in BX, you can see this sort of slow growth of these flapping waves. Um, so BX tells you how far you are from the current sheet center. If it's zero, you're at the current sheet center. Um, so you can see MMS moves uh, 
sort of slightly away from the current sheet center, back again, away, back again, and then the frequency of that motion picks up. So this is the current sheet sort of just flapping up and down. Um, the, uh, now every time MMS flaps away from and then back to the current sheet, you see this north, uh, sorry, this uh, southward um, component of the electric field grows, grows again, grows again. This is the Hall electric field. This is the, it is the, it's J cross B electric field. So it tells you that you have, um, you have, you have essentially broken ideal MHD. Um, J cross B means you have a perpendicular J. So you, it means you have um, particles moving across field lines. Um, uh, now, uh, in the panel below that, I'm showing in green um, uh, EY, the out of plane uh, electric field, in blue VX. Uh, I'll focus on um, the uh, the blue uh, velocity here. You can see each time uh, MMS moves back to the current sheet center, um, the velocity increases. Um, and then below that, I'll focus on VX, uh, sorry, VEX, the electron velocity, um, which is actually a little bit more informative um, because uh, it gives us information not only at the current sheet center, but also away from the current sheet center. So every time MMS moves, Toward the current sheet center, it sees these um, outflowing electrons um, uh, here moving um, away from the Earth. But then when um, MMS moves um, away from the current sheet center, you see this, this flow reversal. And these are actually, these are what we found from simulations. The, the onset of this um, streaming electrons away from the current sheet center is actually the best signature for the timing of reconnection onset. So you can imagine like sort of squeezing a tube of toothpaste as the current sheet is collapsing, sort of some plasma is going to move out either end. But when reconnection starts, it requires inflow. Um, and so these electrons um, away from the current sheet center that are moving in the opposite direction from the outflow, those, that actually tells you that reconnection starts. So reconnection has, um, has started somewhere around here. Um, now, if you zoom in on basically these squiggles uh, in the north-south component of the magnetic field, uh, you see it's really not noise at all. It's actually a coherent signal. Um, these, are, these are flux ropes. These are um, the sort of 2D picture is closed loops of magnetic flux. So what happens when you get reconnection uh, at two point that sort of pinch off magnetic field lines, you're left with an isolated island like that. And so, um, and so each one of these um, here is a magnetic island. Uh, and you can only really tell when you when you zoom in. These are really tiny. These are electron or ion scale uh, loops of magnetic flux. Hey, Kevin. Uh, yep. We have a few minutes. Oh, geez. That. Sorry. I, I I love this story. I get excited by. It. I probably overexcited by. It. Um. Uh. I'll I'll see what I can skip here. This is one of them. Um. We did some analysis over. Um whether uh, there exists a primary X line, which is essentially one X line that engulfs the others. Turns out there is, it's established pretty quickly within a couple minutes. Um, we also looked at uh, the, the criteria of the current sheet at the onset time. Um, and we considered this, uh, this electron tearing criterion. So when this black line reaches one, that means you've surpassed or at least met the criteria for electron tearing, which is one possible way that um, that that reconnection onset works. That's the that's the kinetic scale. Um, you know, the tail goes from um, you know more or less quiet to to full blown reconnection just by via this uh, kinetic scale instability and and whatever's whatever's sort of driving it here, um, and right at the moment of onset that um that uh criterion is is met it goes from being wildly unmet in the beginning to met and then you see reconnection so um uh, further evidence for electron tearing is that flux rope and plasmoids are a result of that so um and now conclusions and future work so we sort of asked those two questions the big picture the small picture question the big picture question to me was probably the most surprising in that you can trigger tail reconnection, you can trigger current sheet thinning 
really with very little input from the solar wind, though ultimately it was the sort of these two solar wind pressure pulses that that triggered the thinning and then collapsed with the current sheet. So it's it's very easy to get tail reconnection from the solar wind. Um, and then ultimately we get this uh, electron tearing picture of reconnection onset where these other tail instabilities don't seem to be there. The tail just goes from quiet to reconnecting the second you meet the electron tearing criterion. Um, and uh, so, so future work, you know, I, I can leave this up while I solicit questions, but really the thing that we're missing here is context in the tail. You know, what are the, what are the bigger scale tail dynamics? You know, we really only have this sort of one dimensional picture. It would be so nice to have a full tail telescope um, like the way we had, you know, more than one data point essentially in the tail at one time. Um, uh, and so we're missing context. So I want to plug um, a mission concept um, uh, I'm working on with um, folks at APL uh, 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 and a few people here at UNH. Um, we're calling it Wedge. Uh, at the time, it's, a, it's a, essentially that. It's a mid-tail telescope. Um, that's really um, the the purpose of it is uh, it's it's three spacecraft developing it for a SMEX. Um, its uh, purpose is to figure out um, sort of the the larger scale context for the causes, properties, and consequences of of reconnection um, beyond the point picture we get from MMS. So um, uh, most likely everyone here, Southwest and UNH, all of you are con conflicted. So none of you will be my reviewer, but if you ever talk to one of my reviewers, be sure to plug this mission. So thanks, I'm over my time, so thanks everybody. And uh, I'll, I, I'll take a, however many questions I have time for. All right, thank you, Kevin. Very nice talk. So uh, if you have any questions, please just uh, jump in, really. Uh, Kevin, I have a question. Uh, this is just a very general, vague question. I'm not trying to get too particular, but uh, I'm just wondering how typical or atypical this process is. I realize it's very unusual to have all this wonderful data set to figure out this particular one, but uh, I'm just kind of wondering if there are a lot of events that, that people don't pay attention to that in fact are this process. So that's a really good question. Um, and that's actually something we're trying to figure out now. So. It's clear about 20% of tail reconnection is during northward IMF. So when you expect no sort of standard loading type um, current sheet thinning to be happening. Um, so it's potential ballpark 20% of, um, of tail reconnection signatures match this type of, uh, type of event. Um, it's also a question that we have of whether or not this process for thinning exists during more like intense storms and substorms. Um, if it, if this type of thinning by, by evacuating thermal pressure from the current sheet, if that, it's a question of whether or not that happens at all, or if it does happen, maybe it's just sort of lost in the mix of everything else that's going on. So I hope somewhere in there was an answer to your question. Definitely, yes, there was. <laughs> Kevin, can I follow on that? Sure. Uh, it sounded like you were fortunate to have DS DMSP fly through uh, at the right time um, on the on, uh, at a conjugate point. Could you look through ISR data or AMISER data, or have somebody look through um, for for other conjunctions to, to see if there are some signatures of of missed events, missed similar events? That's a that's a good question. Um, Actually, uh, so I'm not sure what that I ISR. Is. Oh, I'm sorry, incoherent scatter radar. Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah. No, that's. Um, I would. I would have to. I would have to dig into that. Um, dig into that to 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 really answer answer that question. I have not done that yet. It's plausible that that one could do that, or that we could do that in the future. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? There are some questions in the chat, FYI. Uh, Marisa is asking, uh, are you familiar with the SMILE satellite mission? And is it uh, 
possible that this mission in the future, of course, can uh, fill in some of your context gaps? Uh, I guess not totally is the answer to your first question, am I familiar? And so then, um, I'm not sure, uh, I think it's x-ray imaging, is that right? Imaging the magnetopause, essentially? The magnetopause, yes. Yeah, um, I'm not sure, I would have to, um, I would have to look into that. And uh, one more question from Monica. Uh, what does the asymmetry explain during the formation of plasmoids? And does ampipolar diffusion occur in the magnetosphere connection? If yes, then what are the results? So if asymmetry explains, what does the, asymm what does the asymmetry explain during the formation of plasmoids? Let's see, let's start with that. So, the asymmetry, I guess I'm not sh quite sure. Um, would you mind, uh, perhaps I said something and now I forget it. Uh, I'm not quite sure what asymmetry you're describing, if it's north, south, or yeah, you want sun. to clarify? Oh, yeah, the slide 24. No, 23. Yes. Sorry, go back, 23. Oh, okay. Um, the asymmetry, um, okay, so I see ambipolar, um, maybe uh, the uh, uh, electric field is what you're describing. It's, um, it's uh, asymmetric, um, it, it may appear asymmetric just because we stay mostly on one side of the current sheet, so it seems like it's pointing southward sort of everywhere but that's mostly because we're just northward of the current sheet really if it's a symmetric current sheet it should be symmetric and just point in on either side but it's essentially just an observation bias you you stay on the north side so you see the um you see the southward field does that answer your question i guess that's a that was a wild stab in the dark so all right any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank our speaker again. I will do it for everybody. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and uh, yes. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Nice talk. Okay. <laughs>